I am the seventh son in a big Cuban-American family of nine kids. My six older brothers were born and grew up in Cuba, but my family left during the revolution, and I was the first one born in the U.S. Mine was not a family where you could come home and announce you were going to be a ballet dancer. <laughs> you could be a lawyer, a doctor, an engineer. But I naturally gravitated towards the theatrical. And in fact, before I was a ballet dancer, I was a playwright, producing my first play at age 10. It was called The Case of the Recurring Ennui. I'd heard the word ennui, and I knew it meant something like bored. I wrote the play for my sister, who was eight and was my muse. <laughs> she wore a white, strapless, fishtail gown I'd made out of the canopy off of her bed. And she was lying on a chaise I made out of old suitcases and a red crushed velvet bedspread. And her first line was, oh, I've never been so ennui in all my life. <laughs> Eventually, I followed my sister to ballet school. And it turns out she was quite untalented. <laughs> but I was good at it. She became a lawyer. I became a dancer. <laughs> we grew up largely in the developing world, and in each place my mother would become a social justice warrior of sorts, and she'd take us with her wherever she went, doing famine relief in the Sudan, working with Haitian boat people in the Bahamas, migrant farm workers in South Texas, and it was this experience of getting close to a community, not my own, really reveling in the details of what makes a community's culture special and different, that gave me an appreciation for the specificity of place. I brought this sensitivity to my dance career. Now, can you raise your hand if you took ballet as a child? Uh, so many of you, how great, really great. Ballet is an art form whose practitioners are largely girls and women, yet historically, Leadership in ballet has been dominated by men. Artistic directors and choreographers have been, for the most part, male, like me. This contrasts with modern dance, which was founded in the early 20th century, largely by a bunch of badass women who were rebelling against the strictures of ballet. Think about it. To succeed in ballet training, the young dancer has to be the good little girl. You've got to fit into that corps de ballet of 24 swans. You may not stand out, and your individuality may be held back for the sake of the group. As such, your natural leadership skills may be suppressed. For boys, their individuality is often celebrated, or at least tolerated, because there are so few of them. Ballet's traditions have established what the ideal woman looks like. Small head, long neck. Short torso, slim hips. Flat chest, impossibly long arms and legs, and hopefully, a beautiful face. <laughs> now, can you raise your hand if you felt you fit into that mold when you were a kid? <laughs> you see, the qualities of the ideal woman, as set forth by the male gaze, are pretty tough to achieve. And to make matters worse, we dancers spend our whole lives looking at ourselves in the mirror, not to admire ourselves, but to remind us of what's wrong. It takes a lot of grit for leadership skills to develop in this environment. Even the stories we tell in ballet present a narrow and artificial view of women as vulnerable creatures whose lives are lived in relation to men. You may be a woman trapped in a swan's body, or perhaps you'll sleep for a hundred years, only to be awakened by the kiss of a prince. <laughs> While these ballets are achingly beautiful, their protagonists never live life on their own terms. Is it any surprise that historically, so few women in the field have come forth to lead as artistic directors or choreographers? A lifetime after I followed my sister to ballet school, I moved here to direct Hong Kong Ballet, and I wanted the company to evolve. I believe that art is at its most powerful when people can see themselves reflected in the art, 
and connect to what they see on stage. So we began to retool our repertoire in public image and began developing works that more thoroughly reflect the specificity of Hong Kong and also works that presented women in a more complex and modern way. Quite simply, we wanted Hong Kong ballet to reflect the Hong Kong of today. Early in 2023, we produced a new full-length ballet about the life of iconic fashion designer Coco Chanel. It was created by celebrated female choreographer Annabelle Lopez Ochoa. And unlike ballets like Swan Lake, Giselle, or Sleeping Beauty, this is a ballet about an empowered but flawed woman. Coco ultimately finds success, but not without making tremendous personal compromises along the way. Focusing our spotlight directly on Hong Kong, I created a new production of Romeo and Juliet, set in Hong Kong in the early 1960s, visually inspired by Wong Kar Wai's film, In the Mood for Love. The premise is that Juliet's father, a Shanghainese tycoon, and his wife, a glamorous but cold Tai Tai, want to marry their daughter off to a rich guaylo for social advancement. <laughs> Mahjong games, retro chung sum, and kung fu battles abound. The theater is our ivory tower, a place where we can create the perfect world. But we felt the need to get out of the theater and change the image of ballet as an elitist art form. So we performed outside for free at scores of iconic locations around Hong Kong, pairing choreographers with fashion designers, creating large-scale site-specific works about climate change, and presenting projects with a Hong Kong backstory. Why did we do this? First, we wanted to ensure ballet was accessible to all. Second, we wanted to remind people that beauty is all around us. And all you have to do is put down your phone and look around. And you can see the sheer beauty of the world we live in. Third, in a sneaky way, we wanted to make ballet goers of ordinary people in Hong Kong. So if someone passed by and stopped and watched for, say, 10 minutes, henceforth, they could consider themselves a ballet goer. Mission accomplished. While we are creating these large-scale projects, we were also nurturing emerging voices. One young dancer in our company, Feng Jingyi, grew up training classically in China, but she was yearning for exploration. So she left her home and trained abroad in contemporary dance and choreography before coming to Hong Kong Ballet. Her natural impulse as a choreographer has been to create intimate works which mash up cultural influences from around the globe. One of her most intriguing works is a solo about resilience, set to Maya Angelou's iconic poem, Still I Rise. Jingyi is one of the new breed of ballerinas who can fit into that line of 24 swans, but is also developing her individual voice to create new work and perhaps one day to lead. Ballet is a pliant language which can be used to express so much. Sure, our language can tell stories of swans and princes and girls in Bavaria who die of a broken heart. But it can also tell our stories, stories of real people and real places, here and now. When the curtain rises, what do you see? You see our beautiful dancers, but you also see you. We represent you. Sure, our dancers may be younger than you are. Maybe they're better looking than you are. They can certainly jump higher than you can, but they are you. And the stories they tell reflect the world we live in, with characters who are as complex and flawed as we are. When you see us, we hope you see yourself, your place, your story, and we hope you feel connected to what you see. Thank you.